Hey, this is Sam Lewis here, um, and I have the distinct pleasure to be in conversation with a couple of gentlemen that I have long admired and fortunately been friends with for the last several years, uh, Mr. Dwayne Powell and Mr. John Simmons, both impeccable DJs in the Chicago area. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, sir. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, nice to see you. Thanks for having. Absolutely. Wouldn't have it any other way. So, you know, I want to give a shout out to Antoine Lee and the whole Solar Shrine project uh, for Burning Man for setting this whole thing up. And when Antoine reached out to me and was like, you know, who, do, who would you like to interview talking about house music and any connections to Afrofuturism? I was like, uh, Dwayne Powell and John Simmons, of course. And he was like, those are the people I would agree with. And so I was like, let's make this happen. So thank you. But I did, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, the passing of Dwayne's sister um, just this past weekend. Is that right? Yeah, Saturday. Saturday. I know that that was devastating. So again, for the umpteenth time, I want to offer my condolences publicly. And I know that um, I didn't know her personally, but she's definitely... Um, was a member in great standing of the house music community in this area and was a huge inspiration to you. And so did you wanna kind of speak on uh, her and her legacy with this? Yeah, I mean, she was, you know, that was the eldest, that was my mom and dad's firstborn. So, you know, the eldest is always the first to do everything, you know? Um, and so she was the first, you know, out the gate partying, um, you know, uh, every, 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 she was the original trendsetter for sure because everything that we did after me and my other siblings because there's four of us and she was the oldest um, you know we patterned after her you know um, from you know wanting to go to the parties to the high school I chose to the church we chose she was, she's even the reason my mom was a Christian she was actually the one that chose the church first um, so yeah you know and so I, you, you were saying, like, in lieu of uh, any kind of formal funeral, that you're going to throw just a, a party? Yeah, she don't want a funeral. My, my sister, I could, you know, if you just look at my Facebook and see the pictures, you know, her favorite place in the world, whole wide world was the dance floor. And there was, you would find her in front of the sound system with her eyes closed, zoning out, and just uh, letting loose. And she wanted to party, and so that's what we're going to do. Um, you know, yeah, um, get some of our favorite DJs and let it roll. She want people dancing, 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 because that she loved the music. That's the hard part for me is because I spending, you know, there's so many songs I know that she loves, you know, there's times I would get, I would, I would, you know, hear songs and I'd be like, Ooh, Ooh. And I sent her like, Ooh, you gotta hear this, you know? And, you know, we had that, we had that bond musically. Um, but yeah, that's what she was. You know, she loved the music. She loved the people of the culture and yeah. I heard that. So I I need to get invited, hopefully, to that event, because I know it's going to be just, you know, we, you know, people talk about transcendent experiences that they have on the dance floor. And you alluded to it uh, with how she would get close to the speaker and stuff. And people who aren't into it may not get it. But to me, you know, that is what it's all about. And if that's you, an interesting you, conversation. You know, yeah, the people who don't get it. Uh, I was just having this conversation <clears throat> about that. People don't understand that kind of freedom. Um, you know, that freedom to be in a space and to zone out. And although you can be in a party of a room for 200 to how many other people, you know, at that point on the dance floor, it's you and the music and you're the only one in the room. You know what I mean? Um, people don't understand that kind of inner joy mm -hmm. um, when it comes down to music and release. I know I, I've I've felt that experience more times than I would have thought, you know, because I, I grew up in St. Louis. And so I knew about house music, but it really didn't hit me on that deep level until I moved here in 95. And then I was like, oh, now I see, you know, yes. and you really do see it's like having that third eye opened. And I've been at 
several events with both of you and have felt that experience and uh, for coming from your turntables. And so I want to thank you for that because it's, it's, it's like an, an enlightenment. It's an awakening, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it puts you into a different mind frame. And I think that that's what separates house fans from a lot of other uh, genres of music um, because they have that connection and people can say what they want. I felt I love music, but I've never felt anything like that um, being on the dance floor and you just, if you don't get it, you don't get it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I did want to say like, what brought you all to the music and when did that happen? And the, uh, I know, I remember, I always tell this story and John gets tired of, of hearing it, I'm sure, but you know, I, we met in working in a restaurant back in the nineties. And, you know, I think you had been DJing for a while, but you were still getting your chops up and, that was over 20 years ago. Well, it was about 20 years ago now at this point, because I think that was like early 2000s, like 2000, 2001 or something like that. The and opera days, yeah, I think was, yeah, definitely early 2000s, maybe 02, 03, but right around 02, I think. Absolutely. And so how long had you been in the music at that point and what brought you into it? Uh, you know, I've been around the music the whole, my whole life pretty much, you know. Uh, my dad was a DJ. Uh, Big Bob Simmons also had a sound company in Chicago. So I always grew up with the music, um, even though I didn't really DJ per se until high school. I always liked to collect records and CDs. Um, I remember we had a record store over in Evergreen Plaza, but um, I didn't really start DJing until my sophomore year of high school when um, a buddy of mine in band, uh, in marching band, brought a mixtape to band camp. And uh, just seeing him do it was really inspiring. And uh, we were listening to B96 DJs at a time. I mean, I really grew up mostly on hip hop and R&B. Um, and then, I, but I went to high school at St. Rita and a lot of the kids there were in the house, techno, freestyle, a lot of dance music. I had never listened to B96 before high school. I grew up mostly GCI, you know, 102.7, but they were all in the house music. He had a house music tape and we patterned ourselves after those B96 DJs, Bad Boy Bill, Julian Perez. Also listened to KKC 89.3 on the South side which is NUR on the north side, and listen to DJs like Lloyd Devastating, Jack Master, Pink House, which was their sister station on 950 back in the day, rest in peace, and uh, listen to people like DJ Napitz and Gab Man. So growing up with that ghetto house influence um, from listening to the radio and just, you know, being around people who were into the music. I heard that. What about you, Dway? Um, Well, starting out, all of my mom's brothers were, were DJs. Um, so I grew up around music since born. My mom really, really claims that when I was three years old, she bought me a tricycle and I never rode it. She claims that I turned it over on its side and I put a 45 on the wheel and I would spin it, hoping it would make a sound. I was like, okay, uh -huh. whatever. You just, but she sticks by that story. Uh, um, but yeah, I grew up around my, my, all of my uncles were DJs in the seventies um, to the early eighties. And then my paternal grandmother at one point, she owned a building uh, on the south side in, in the Pullman area. And at one point, she it was a lounge. Um, and my aunt and them lived upstairs. So I would kind of sneak and look into what was going on in the lounge and they in there, you know, and there. And this was this was actually this was disco days. This was like 1977. Um, so I would kind of sneak and see what they're doing downstairs and, you know, that kind of thing. So I was always kind of curious, but I grew up in a social setting because of that, you know, um, social culture. So, um, again, my sister, you know, she started partying probably like in 1981, something like that. Um, and slowly but surely, you know, she, you know, um, took me to my first party, which was at Mendo High School. Um, you know, those big parties that was happening there. And um, uh, she created a monster <laughs> because I became, I, I, I got addicted. I got addicted to, to the, to the you know, coming into this big sound system and coming into this, yeah, I got addicted. But so, yeah, you know, so you, you come into the thing and then of course you have to like build up your collection, you know? And that takes, I mean, it's, it never ends, right? <laughs> and yeah. so 
where where do your collections stand at this point? You know, and because I remember hearing the story about Derek Carter. Um, and this was years ago, and he had like uh, a devastating fire or something, and lost a huge uh, portion of his collection. Um, and so, how big is your collection? Is it or is it an addiction? And do you like go through you know, what? peculiarities do you have with like how you store it, how you organize it and, and all that? Well, for me, my, 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 um, my um, collection has changed over the years as the formats have changed. Um, and quite naturally. So first of all, I didn't come onto the scene in, in, the, in the mid eighties, I wasn't expiring to DJ. I was a dancer and I was in dance crews. Um, and then I was, you know, yeah, I was in, I was in several dance groups. And when the preppy era, I was in passion. And then I was, you know, in the house culture, I was in a group called G2000, um, who ended up being, um, street promoters for Lil Lewis and, um, Diamond Court. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was, that was my thing was getting people to the party and then being the energy on the floor. And that led me into like doing more street promotions and then, actually consulting because I did collect music. I, I, I mean, I haven't collected music since before the house scene because again, I grew up in a music culture uh, and, and, and around DJ. So I, I already had a start when I started to DJ It's because I already had records because I just love to collect. Um, and there were quite a few DJs actually that were spinning from my crates. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So yeah, I did, actually started, I didn't, my first time playing public wasn't all the way until 1997. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because again, I was just the dancer. I was the I was the one that wanted to come in and, you know. And then at that point, like, the DJ uh, culture had became a little bit uh, mean and cutthroat. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. Like, I don't want anything to get in the way of me loving the music. I don't want I don't want that kind of energy because Chicago birthed a lot of great DJs and unfortunately, well, I won't say unfortunately, that's not the right word, but we have more DJs than we have trees. <laughs> and, you know, the playing field gets so crowded and then, you know, with the closing of a lot of venues and the entrance of rave laws that shut down so much stuff, we had more DJs than we had venues to play, you know, and it started people to get very, very, you know, everybody wants to play. So I didn't want to be in the midst of that, but um, I don't. I don't know if you're familiar with a DJ by the name of Anthony Nicholson, producer. Um, Anthony Nicholson and Ron Trent was the first to give me a residency in '97. And that shout out yeah. to Ron for sure. Yeah. So these collections, like, what about you, John? I know your collection. I totally walked away from the collection, didn't I? Okay. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> There's sometimes things are best found on those divergent paths. So I appreciate those stories because I didn't know that. And you say 97, like it was, oh, I just started in 97. Um, that was 23 years ago. But, you know, that's that's <laughs> the time in the game. You know, it's like I I start thinking about the late 90s and it seems like yesterday. And I'm like, oh, it wasn't yesterday. That was a long, long time ago, uh, relatively speaking. But you, you've been in the game and paid your dues, maybe not since the 80s. But I think that there's been waves you know, there's been yeah, of, yeah. So of, I mean, eighty five, I was doing street promotions for house culture. So, so yeah, what, what, my, my my collection started probably you know as a as a young person, but I just moved from the north side to the south side, and I'd say I've got about forty crates, thirty forty crates. I don't know. You don't think you have as much as you do until you have to move. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was like, I won't go interrupt you, Sam, but. John, but moving is when you realize how much you have. Yeah. I'm like, wow, why do I have all these records? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. When um, I moved from Hyde Park, boy, my the, the movers, because I hired movers, they was like, okay, we just need to know what you do because no one in our, our, our have this many records or this many shoes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a DJ. That's someone who DJs for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. Yeah, so, crates, are, crates are out of control, and I I don't shop as much as I used to. Yeah. Um, like like Dwayne said, as as technology went on over the years, your records go to CDs, and then from CDs, you know, you go to Serato. From Serato, you go to controllers or USB sticks. 
So I still have a ton of CDs from the era when we were playing a lot of oh, man. You know, my, CDs. My CD collection, because, you know, I worked at, uh, at Dr. Wax for so many years. Oh, man. The collection is probably even crazier. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't gotten rid of any of mine. Yeah. I haven't yeah. either, quite frankly. I'm sure, you had a collect I'm sure you've had a collected so many CDs that had have come your way. Where So how long were you at Dr. Wax? I was at Dr. Wax. I started in 98. 98. So 98 until they closed in 2010. Wow. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. Working, at, working at record stores, that's how you really, really develop a problem. Oh. And so mind you, before Dr. Wax, I was the buyer at Cargo. Uh, okay. I was that dance and dance music by at Cargo. And then after Dr. Wax, I went back to working for Dirt when he created Groove. Okay. Uh, so, I, you know, and that was my, I was there, you know, actually before I moved in where I now, I was at Groove. So working where you actually sell and, and, and order the music is even worse. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. I mean, I'm a definitely record store head. Record store had worked at Vintage Vinyl in St. Louis for years. Oh, yeah, Vintage. And I was at the used counter buying vinyl, but it was mostly hip hop. And I would get us people come in with stacks, and I'd be like, mine, mine. Okay, the store <laughs> can have that. Mine, you know, I it didn't even make it to the store, yeah. you know? Yeah. So did, did you work in record stores also, John? I did. I worked at uh first record store I worked at was Hot Jams, actually. Uh, 2000, Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you for that. We have been trying to figure out what the name of that store was. It was Hot Jams. Yes. Yeah. yeah, 50th and Pulaski at Archie. Yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, that was the first record store I started shopping at back in 93. And uh, people I met there, Andre Lopez, the owner, Frankie Vega, Phantom 45. That was where I first started shopping for records and pick, seeing rave flyers because I was too young to go. I was still in high school and my parents weren't letting me go out anywhere uh at the time so i i dreamed about going to raves and reading thousand words magazine um but i was able to work at high jams for a short time around 2000 2001 then also worked at supreme on milwaukee avenue mm -hmm. which was also early 2000s um i think that was before i worked at opera was i worked at supreme that was 2002 and then that store mysteriously burned down uh won't get into that one too much but um Worked at Supreme, and then I worked at Wax Attic on Ashland, which was on Ashland and Augusta for a few years. So, I've I've done my time in a few record stores, and you know, paid my paid my dues there, and you know the experiences I had there at all the record stores that I worked at were great, and I wouldn't trade them in. But it's definitely hard when 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 all those records come your way, and uh, if you look at most DJs at record stores, they have these huge stacks that'll be like you know 20 records deep that they've been holding for the last two years that no one's been able to touch so it's got to be hard for owners to regulate. I, I think dusty groove's got a pretty good regulation system right like don't you have to be there for a certain yeah. amount of time before you can touch it yeah 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 they the oh, dusty groove gosh. definitely um implemented that because yeah you can't have a store full of dr wax it was terrible because we had a store full of music lovers uh-huh nothing would get the floor <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, it is. So you would have to order such large amounts of, of yeah. something to come in because yeah. it all got hoarded by the people that worked there. Yeah, and, and they deserve we, we deserved it because the salaries they paid us. Well, come on now, <laughs> you know. It was definitely for the love. It was definitely for the love. No, they got you. You know. Yeah, it's worse than being a teacher, man. You'd be out there. Oh God, you come out with a negative balance. You work all yeah. week and you hold them. I know. But you know, John, do you remember? Do you remember the days though of of the whole record store corridor, not just Clark Street, um, the whole Clark Street between starting at Fullerton and going all the way to Belmont. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was the, the you know times where because you had you had Tower right there at Fullerton, and as you walk yep. down on Clark Street, you had the first Doctor Wax. Then you you would eventually get to Hi-Fi Records. You would get to Secondhand Tunes. You would get to I can't remember the name of the record store that was next to that that had also sold the video and DVD, the bootleg DVD uh, VHS so concerts and stuff. And then you had Gramophone. And then you would make your way down Broadway. There was Broadway Records. There was Reckless. And you would walk over to um, it was another record store on Belmont. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. But you would spend your entire paycheck just walking down Clark Street. 
Absolutely. But by the time the day is over, you have gotten so much music, but your money is gone. Yeah, I worked at Tower. That was one of my first jobs I had when I was in, uh, when I moved here. And it was just an amazing time. And, and you know, I that's one of the things that I've tried to bring back at Elastic in holding um, events that fortunately you two have been a part of over the last, has it been like four or five years now that we've been like mm-hmm. ramping that up? Um, is to really bring back that vibe, you know, to bring back that time when people were dancing and like, and it was not just dancing, but, you know, we, the parties that we thrown, it's like people don't have their phones up all the time, like looking at, staring at the DJ. They're like doing their thing. They're like actually partying, you know, and being in a room that has a good dance floor to be able to dance. And then some of the systems, the sound systems, the custom systems, especially that Ron brought in um, mm-hmm. to Elastic, because we don't have it like that there. <laughs> but uh, And John's brought in some thought as well, um, it really made a huge difference. And just trying to bring back that era and really place house where it deserves to be placed. And I think we're at that point in the, in the history where it needs to be elevated in that lexicon to be this supreme stuff that stands up to jazz, to blues, to whatever you want to put up against it, especially as it relates to music of the diaspora, but just any music. And so um, where do you think, how do you think that that effort is going? Has it really reached the the place where it deserves the reverence that it deserves, or is there still some work to do? John, you want to take that? I I think we got a lot more work to do. Um, You know, I I think that uh, with EDM, being what it is, um, I think that's sort of house music's revenge in the same way that Frankie said that house music was disco's revenge. Well, EDM is kind of house music's re- revenge to a certain degree. Like the term deep house is now a modern pop term. You know, young kids are are asking uh, for deep house and they want to play deep house. So um, I think we can continue to push it forward. Um, Obviously, I would like to see the pay grades go up. And a lot of it, man, when you talk about 2020 and COVID and everything that happened, I mean, that just flipped the game on its head right there. I mean, wherever it was headed, I mean, who even knows at this point what the industry, what the industry is going to be like. Um, So as far as profit, profitability with DJs, um, I, I don't know what online sales you know, are doing right now. I don't know if DJs are really doing that well off off the band camp sales. I'm sure plenty are, uh, or wherever the platforms that they're using, but we're at an interesting time right now because, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because the house music story is still being told, you know, um, mm-hmm. from the 80s into the 90s and, and into this current generation. We do a night called Strictly 90s where we honor the 90s, but you know, all the decades could be put up against each other. I wish I could have been around in the 80s. Um, And then you get in the 2000s. And it's been interesting to see how it's progressed. Um, You look at what's going on with tracks records and how they're being sued by, you know, multiple artists, Mr. Fingers and Adonis. And I feel like these artists are finally trying to go after. And that should have happened. You know, because they've always been underpaid and underrated, you know, so... Uh, with that being said, I still feel like it's that way, especially when in the modern lexicon of pop music and EDM. But I do feel like EDM has sort of helped put house back out there now. Like people are listening to house music now because of EDM. So I think we're on a good track. But um, it's interesting to see what will happen to the industry um, moving forward from this year. Yeah, they were talking about, you know, people are doing these VR sets now. And um, I'm actually going to be interviewing a VR DJ uh, later tonight. And so have you thought about that realm? Have you? Yeah, trying to, because, yeah, I'm steady trying to navigate it. It's it's definitely hard because house was not built on distance. Um, House, you know, was built on, like you talk about that sound system and that, and that camaraderie and that, and that spiritualness in the room um you know so you can you can hear this music 
you know, I, you know, just being on a computer um, doesn't really capture the feeling, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. So it's been interesting trying to, you know, navigate uh, the virtual world and 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 um, yeah, just you know, because like I was talking recently about. You know, there's so with hip hop, right? There's the five elements. There's the I forgot how it goes. There's the DJ. There's the breaker. There's the uh, knowledge. Uh, what is it? Graffiti MC. and yeah. MC. Yeah. Right. Um, there's elements to house as well. You know, and one of those is the sound system. Um, the sound system in, in itself is an element. That was why you talked about the stuff that John, the John would bring in, the stuff that Ron Trent would bring in, because that plays a major role. Um, in the culture. Oh, it's huge. Um, and not just the sound system and not just being live, but being packed. Like, you know, you got to yeah. like sweat and on people and, you know, you got to feel that vibe. I mean, it's really visceral um, and, and deep. And so even trying to hold a, a live event socially distant won't capture it, you know? No. No, we tried like when they reopened uh, uh, into phase four or whatever, and we tried to go back to doing things at Wise Out, and we tried to do the social things. So we we did it as best we could, but the, the other thing about house is that, especially the underground, we love we love on folks, you know. So there's a ceremony, like there's a beginning of it where it's like the hugging hour when you get there, everybody's hugging each other and. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, finding their place and everything else. But there's definitely, you know, we love on each other hard. So distance don't work for us. <laughs> so, yeah. But it's definitely going to be interesting because what another thing that COVID has happened has did, though, with the virtual DJ, it has leveled the playing field. Because, like I was saying about, you know, so many DJs, not enough venues. There's, of course, quite a few venues on the Internet, you know, because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so a lot of DJs that I, that wasn't being heard are starting to be heard, actually. Um, you know, and I'm just hoping that if it get back to a point where we can go back into the world and DJ in, in, in front of audiences, that the essential work that DJs have done virtually, because a lot of people have created, I mean, look at, you know, look at the things that happened with D-Nice and and stuff like that. I'm I'm really hoping that that would make the world see the value of the DJ again. Um, and like John said, um, compensate us for it, you know, yeah. financially. Yeah. Um, you know, um, because right now, I mean, it's literally a DJ saved my life. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay, so tell me about some of your favorite stories that's that's one thing i know that and i know it could get wild it's like i've seen i've probably been a party to some of them but tell me some of your greatest memories from from attending events and and maybe you were djing maybe you were just attending you know Dwayne, you want to go ahead kick it off oh god mine is long <laughs> mine is long um, I'm going to give a shout out because, you know, we just also lost Dave Medusa Shelton, um, the owner of Medusa's and Medusa's is definitely, um, a, a part of my, uh, musical fabric, a part of my DNA, if you will, uh, because Medusa's is where I, I really got to experience house from a different, on a different sp- perspective. I, you know, um, if it wasn't for Dave Shelton and Medusa's, I, I mean, I'm a kid from, I um, was born in Stateway Projects from Inglewood, from there to Inglewood to Roseland. And so I'm from like three of the, the notorious African and American communities on the South side. And my world was pretty insular, uh, before Medusa's. Um, so, you know, going up to um, Belmont to Medusa's, I got to experience, you know, punk and alternatives and, you know, just so many other things, um. And so, yeah, my story I'm going to tell is from Medusa's. It was from, uh, um, it was Thanksgiving 1988, the night that Lil Lewis first dropped the needle on French Kiss. Yeah, 
<laughs> it was at Medusa's. Um, it was at Medusa's first. It was at Medusa's first. Wow. And I don't know if you guys remember the way Medusa's was set up, but you know that room was very big, and you had that that floor. You had the big tall speakers that people even danced on top of the speakers, mm-hmm. and then you had the stage. It was like different levels, right? And right at that moment, I was on the stage, and I was at this high level, and I was looking down in this crowd, right? So do you guys remember the movie uh, Ten Commandments? Yes. With Dawson Heston. Yeah. You remember the part after they after he had freed them from Egypt and they had made it to safe state safe grounds and he went up into the mountains and that's what God was talking to him and giving the commandment. And while he was doing that, they was creating the golden calf or starting to celebrate and, and, and party. When he came out of the mountains and he looked down and the crowd was just going crowd look crazy celebrating this golden yeah. calf. And that's how it looked as I'm looking down. When 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 that song and when when that song slowed down and yeah. first kiss and no one saw it coming because we had never heard it before and the way that song commanded the audience and then the way it stopped and, it, and then the way the crowds I'm looking down like I said that's what it, that's what I think of is the t- t- commandments when he's looking when Moses was looking down and pandemonium was just and so on it was crazy crazy wow. crazy it was crazy that's awesome. That's awesome. What about you, John? I know that's a, that's a that's a tough one right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, that that one's kind of hard to top, you know, because when you when you think about you know the term Jack in the Box or beating the box, Lil Lewis is is definitely one of the first people you think of. I mean, yeah. he's legendary, you know, especially for people that came before me in the house scene. I mean, Lewis is the one person that people kind of look at as like this dude came on. He was he was phenomenal. He was he was a phenom and. and as a matter of fact, the first, the first, my first memories of house actually were at a house party. Um, I was in like fifth or sixth grade, and I remember three records being played, and it was French Kiss by Lil Lewis, uh, Video Clash by Lil Lewis, <laughs> and Work That Motherfucker by Steve Poindexter. Yeah. I don't remember anything else about this party <laughs> but hearing those three songs over and over again. So, I, so Lil Lewis is 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 a part of my. Yeah, house. I, I, I call it my house father for sure. The house father, uh, yeah. he was my house father for sure. Um, he doesn't get the credit that he deserves because he single almost single handedly raised new generations of house, um, and house culture that would definitely not my generation would not be as loyal had not been for Lil Lewis. Um, yeah. He wasn't the first DJ I heard, but he was when I when I happened upon Lil Lewis because when I went to the music box. That's, you know, that's like the home of the underground, right? Um, and, and I was lucky enough to, to be able to sneak in young. Um, and that was an experience because Ron Hardy was, I mean, that man played like, whoo, he just played, you know, his plan was just like, oh my God, when I happened upon that energy, I, I didn't know what to do. Like that, you talking about spiritual, and first of all, it's dark and it's just strobe lights and it's just nothing but all of this, this, the sound system and this music, but it was, I was in a space that I was, I wasn't among my peers because there was my sister's generation and stuff like that. When I happened upon the Lewis, that's when I felt like I was home. Mm. Wow. So yeah. Wow. I, I wish I could have been around in that generation, you know, to, to, to have that, you know, warehouse music box, even Medusa's. I, I missed Medusa's. Uh, for me, it was the rave scene where I, I made my memories and mm-hmm. uh, you know i'm still friends to a lot of those people this day but just driving up for the first time and hearing those speakers just rattle those windows from a few blocks yeah. away and to but, see everybody dressed up it was just it blew my mind but that's the one thing that i i really would hope in this culture is that we can get to the point that realizing that wherever you started those memories are valid like you have these people who act like if you didn't get to the music box or if you didn't get to the power plant or if you didn't get to these certain spaces yeah. that your like your house experience is inauthentic and that's so untrue you know what i'm saying yeah um, absolutely because just at elastic you know there was a certain new year's eve event with a certain legendary singer that john happened to bring singing brighter days oh yeah that's right that's right that's and right Ajay. this was 2016 right after the election and i think people just needed a release at that moment and that was it was it was a great moment 
mm-hmm. have her come out and do that. And she was so gracious and just so it's so raw, you know, it just it took you back. It was like an 88 type experience, you know, because it was just so raw like that. I love Daj- it. Dajay for me in the 90s is what, you know, some other people would be in the 90s. You know, you had Dajay when you when you talk about house music in the 90s, to me, nothing is more Chicago than brighter days when you hear that when that's when that ooh uh i e comes on something just happened to people you know? i don't like, understand I don't care who you are Daje is absolutely incredible yeah and i'm just not understanding like she was like our our generation lolila hadaway you know that yeah. that you know that diva voice that big voice that yeah. that church voice to you know to the music and to me, I don't understand why she didn't become to that status in, in terms of like uh, house music, in, in terms of, uh, you know, people refer to Brighter Day and like, oh, you got me up. Um, um, but that should, should be so much more. Yeah. Come from because she's just incredible. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, and I, think, I don't think we've absolutely. heard a voice. I don't think we've heard a voice in, in house music like that since. I, I can't think of any. I, I can't think of any that have been so influential. Like, when you feel it in your bones, it's just when you when you hear her. I'm not gonna sing her lyrics right now, you know. But when you hear it, it's it's house, it it's is. Chicago, you know. I, I can't think of anything, any voice that encapsulates any female voice that encapsulates Chicago house or male voice for that matter um, more than Dajay. Um, and she's super sweet, humble, kind person to work mm-hmm. with. She is. We, we were honored to have her. I mean, we were. And that's the thing we is, people like her really, it sets the bar so high with doing any kind of vocals with House. And it's like, if you can't get there, don't, don't, just <laughs> don't. You know, my mom is my mom is she's real hard on vocalists. Like she's a Lolita Holloway you know, Shaka Khan, you know, she grew up, you know, in the Aretha kind of school. So a lot of these vocalists are not for her. She's like, what is that? You know, (laughs) she's like, just play tracks. You know, I I can't, I can't deal with these vocalists right now. So. So John, with with that, I got a quick question if I may ask. Yeah. Um, So I had, I went live um, one of my virtual events. So a friend of mine who, Actually, I used to party with me heavily. She used to be my dance partner back in the day at the parties, but she left Chicago in in ninety three. Okay. Um, has been and has and has been living in California ever since. And so, a lot of uh, people who have left the era, you know, left at those days, kind of when they hear house music, they kind of go back to what they knew back in the nineties, right? Uh-huh. Uh huh. So she, you know, so she finally got to hear me virtually because, of course, I've never gone to California to play. And of course, I wasn't playing a lot of classics because I was playing new music. Yeah. And I was playing, you know, and she was like, you didn't play enough vocal. You uh-huh. know, do you have this thing in your, in, your, in your DJ and are you more conscious about how many tracks or instruments you're playing versus vocal, you know, kind of thing? Is that uh-huh. is that important for you in the music? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to, you know, that's a great question because I, I go in with the mindset of thinking that you want to hear vocals. Um, I, I tend to hear that from females from time to time that you didn't play enough vocals. I think some people want to have those vocals to connect with. They want to have something to kind of sing along to. But I, mm. I think in, in house, I don't, I, it's not necessarily that in house. And like I was saying with my mom, here I am putting this set together thinking that I'm going to play all these vocals and she's like nah I don't need all those vocals so I think that yeah it definitely is something to be conscious of um playing too many tracks you know I mean we could try I'm I'm sure you you know you and I could track out all night but I do try to keep some vocals I I do try yeah it is something that that I try to be mindful of because you know there's going to be some people out there who want something some something to guide them to a certain degree Beside just a track, so yeah, I I definitely do think that you know, pepper in some vocals here and there, even if it's just once every maybe three or four tracks. Mm. And it's because I noticed you do play a, a good amount of vocals in in your sets, John. And it's like I've noticed that. Um, and follow me, you know, 
I've heard people bash that vocally speaking, but I don't care what you say. I love that song. You can don't you talk about that song, you know, because that's just okay. uh, you know. <laughs> That would be nice. It's an anthem. It's an anthem. It's an anthem. But people are like, oh, they are key. Like certain haterific type people who shall remain nameless. I'm just going to be honest. I can't stand that song. I knew it. Oh, man. I do have flesh about. Flesh about. I'm guilty. guilty. But I do actually have some, um, I have some wonderful 90s memories uh, uh, around, you know, that's when we were partying at a club called Bistro up north off of uh, Argyle and Clark. Um, and so when I first started hearing some of those, so this was in the 90s, um, that I started hearing some of those songs. So I have a lot of memories there, but yeah. So <laughs> what black. about the song that doesn't do it for you? Uh, it is definitely has a lot to do with his flatness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I've never critiqued the vocals of that song. You know, it's just, <laughs> I heard Julian Perez play it one time on B96, and I, and I was, like, deep for him, you know, at the time. And I was, like, deep. But that's one of those songs where it's, like, certain crowds will love you if you play it, but as a DJ, yeah, you're like, okay, all right, here we go. Here we go again, you know, and I just, <laughs> you know, two verses and out. That's all I'm thinking. <laughs> you know? I heard that. That's yeah, awesome. that that's... And so you you touched on something, Dwayne, about, you know, because one of my questions was kind of how do you move, how are you in your practice moving the, the, the music forward? And I think one of the easiest and best ways is to be playing new music, you know? Um, but then there's certain segment of people, the, the, the classic, the old school people that want to keep it within a certain parameters and it's not their experience if there's hearing something that they don't that they never heard before not everyone but there's a good segment of people and so i appreciate when i get turned on to new music um and when and you've done that a lot for me both of you have where i'm like what what is this but i feel it and it's to me that's growth and that's moving something forward and not becoming stagnant because that was one of the reasons why i stopped going out when i was back in my yeah. 30s because you hear the same thing you're like yeah if I hear this yeah. song one more time, I'm going to lose it, you know? And it's I'm classic, so you, you can't deny it's a classic, but, I mean, how many times can you hear I'm it? I'm telling you, when if you if I hear Harold Melvin and Bruno's Bad Luck, I'm ready to go to the bathroom, and I'm kind of ready to go home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm glad that I, I think that we have finally got to the point where people appreciate and love the new music. Um. I haven't been to many sets in years here in Chicago where, you know, you are confined to playing so many classics. Um, and I love that. I love that. Um, because that's what needs to happen. I mean, we can't be sit here still playing and, and trying to gain memories that we got in the eighties or, you know what I mean? Or whatever, or even in the nineties, like we are in 2020, you know what I'm saying? So think about it. We're 20, 20 years out of 2000. So you're trying to take you trying to get me to take you back to 40 years ago, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. like you know, no, you know. So I'm glad that we are to that point. I'm always trying to be conscious when I play. Um, you know, you kind of case the room. You got to look at your audience. Um, and I'm always trying to. So I will always try to throw a classic in there, perhaps. You know what I'm saying? Um, and compass it within my set, and then, you know. Once, once you, it, I, w I have these certain things where I feel like this is my gift. This is my gift to you. And now when you give to them, they give back to me um, and trust in my journey when I play. I heard that. You know. How do you feel about that, John? What, how do you incorporate the new versus the classic in, in, your, in, in your sets? Yeah, I try to stay abreast as I can, you know, of, of new music that's out there. You know, um, I get on track source, I'm on SoundCloud, I'm on Bandcamp, um, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Spotify, you know, I love my Discover Weekly on Spotify. I find a lot of new, uh, good new music uh, in that realm, although it's not necessarily house, a lot of it is jazz and mm -hmm. modern Same. punk and yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of that stuff. That scene is really is really blowing up nowadays as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, definitely it's about you know, keeping the music moving forward. I think at the same time, um, holding people's interest. So again, it's like, if, 
it, playing something recognizable, even if it's just something maybe every three or four tracks, just to kind of keep the listener engaged because you are painting a picture. But uh, but I think also, you know, tr trying to be mindful of the fact that people are giving you their time and they want something kind of to hold on to from time to time. So I think it's a good balance to try to have music, uh, obviously trying to push the music forward, but to dip into different realms. I think one era that gets forgotten about a lot is the 2000s era realm as well. And There's uh, so uh, much good music come out, came out then. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. Three Degrees era. That's another group that I feel like they, they had a great run, you know, when they were doing their thing at Zentra and that, you know, Quentin Harris, Shelter era, and mm. there were some really good, really good tunes of that era. DJ Spinna. Um, speaking of classic, Shauna Scoffrey, Days Like This, that you probably yeah. heard like yeah. a thousand times, but that era gets forgotten about a lot. That had a For me, that era was also, that was also the Broken Beat era, too. Man. Uh, and so, Man. yeah. 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 See, people actually forget, like when John said about, you know, the they've discovered in the music, and all of it, not necessarily being a house. People actually forget what house is. It's a culmination of all these genres. You, so nothing is off limits. Oh. You know what I mean? So, you know, it is not uncommon for me to play Afrobeat in my set. It's not uncommon for me to play some jazz funk in my set. It's not uncommon for me to play Broken Beat in my set because that's what house culture is. Yeah, I remember yeah. I, when I first asked some Chicagoans back in the 80s, I was like, what is house? You know, and they were like, well, it's kind of a bunch of things, there's just, it's a sound that can be found across multiple genres of music, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, okay, it sounds like something that, like, it reminds me of hip hop. And that's something that I grew up, you know, definitely a child of hip hop and how hip hop was influenced by so many different genres. Yeah, like, they're, they're children that come from the same cloth. Exactly. And they have much closer relationship than I think a lot of people may have thought at some point mm. in the past. But um, and then Hip House kind of <laughs> was this weird marriage. We was like, that, yeah, but, nah, we don't want that. <laughs> but I must say, though, John, John brought some fire. You brought, you know, we had Fast uh, Eddie. We had yeah, the legend, Fast, Fast Eddie. Eddie. We had Elastic. <laughs> And we brought some legends to Elastic. I didn't, I didn't yeah, yeah, listen, yes, uh, because I mean, all, been, we've all been a part of some great music. I've opened for Nikki Siano at, at Elastic. Nikki Siano was in the house. Oh my! Wow. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. It's been some amazing. Man, there was some. Music. There was been some parties at Elastic Boy that Sam eventually had to shut down because they just got whoo. <laughs> well, you know, around that four or five in the morning, Mark is like, okay, y'all got to go. Oh, I know. I know how Sam is. Too. <laughs> that was before I got in shape too. Now I'm, I'm like, I got, I got my, got my shape on. I'm on another event now. I'll, I'll go like, let's go six, seven. Let's, let's have breakfast here, you know? Because that's what you know. At some point, I, I used to love that. You know, you kick it all night. They lock the door, and then, like in St. Louis, at least, this one little cafe called Two Black Cats. They'd have uh, house music events, and then son would come up they roll out eggs and breakfast and then we'd all just chill out and eat breakfast and then go home saves a trip to a diner and it was really cool you know so i try to create recreate that kind of vibe because that's that's the realness you know and it's like you can go to places where they're like oots, 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 all night long and it's loud and it's not loud doesn't always equal better you know it's just yeah, exactly it's, exactly I, I really learned um people in and, the and, and, tempo sound does, and tempo doesn't mean doesn't mean energy exactly uh, yes yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm at a cool 122 these days how about you guys as far yeah. as yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, that's 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 a, that's a that's a good spot that 122 for me yeah uh, that's where i'm at yeah I miss doing my events at Reggie's though because I was I, my my DJ sets at Reggie's at six hours, uh -huh. like a six hour set, and I always start, I always start somewhere around like eighty nine. Uh huh. And you know by the second hour I'm at one hundred and one, and then by the yep. third hour I'm at one twelve. Yep. And then by the fourth hour, I'm, yeah, I didn't get to like one nineteen, one twenty, and then yep. yeah. That's yeah, my favorite set to play. 
88, 88 to 128. Yeah. Well, 128 for me, it's like, oh, okay, nah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Ron you, you got fucking over or something, you know, you got to have at least one of those 128. Yeah, dead and yeah, you know? love it is in my game because those are fastest. I don't know what. I was yeah. listening to a Ron Hardy mix the other day and I was just like, oh my God, this stuff is going fast. Yeah, I heard he used to play, I heard Ron used to play really fast. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. I Everybody was picture. high, so they, they wasn't. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Wow. You need to make some T-shirts with those BPMs on it. I have a Tech Life T-shirt that says 160. It's pretty cool because they make footwork at 160 BPM. And so it's a red T-shirt that just says 160 on there. So if you know, you know. (laughs) If you know, you know. (laughs) So, you know, I don't know if you all are familiar with the Solar Shrine project that uh, Antoine Lee and them are doing. Um, It's a really cool project that was supposed to be a Burning Man this year, but now, you know, all things COVID have turned Burning Man into this virtual event. But, um, you know, a lot of that project and is centered around this structure that is definitely ancient Egypt type of vibe to it. And these towers that have flames shooting out of them. And then there's like, a, 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 a disc of rye in the on the bottom that's set uh, to be in alignment with the sunrise and it illuminates at the sunrise and then there's a stairwell that goes up to a, a, a top floor you could do yoga have djs and stuff in there i mean it's a really cool project and obviously in the the afrofuturist realm you know so you think about Afrofuturism, and to me, it has so many different manifestations. Um, one not to be forgotten amongst that is that it envisions a, a future where Black people are there, you know? <laughs> and so yeah. first and foremost, you know, um, that's any future, um, as long as we're a part of it and contributing. But, you know, I've always looked at at house music and just DJ music, electronic music in general is such futuristic music and in being driven in so many ways by people of color, black people. Um, Mm -hmm. And that has always, you know, and I know that there's been generational differences where some people who are more born and bred in in an instrument based culture, which I got love for that too, but it just seems like in this modern era and looking forward, we had to get the tools of creativity that were available to us. And for most of us, records and record players was available to us. Mm. There weren't a lot of trumpets sitting around <laughs> my neighborhood, right. you know? Yeah, right. But there was but my my aunt downstairs had a turn to had the old the old school big uh furniture piece turntable, you know, that that was like about six feet long. And I found my cousin's stack of records and it's like Hendrix and Talking Heads and Miles Davis Bitches Brew and and it just like blew my blew my mind. And so um how do you see kind of house music in the context of Afrofuturism and does it lead in that? in that era or is there some other type of sound or music that really speaks to an Afrofuturistic mindset more than, than maybe house or, or DJ music does? Hmm. Dwayne, I'll uh, let you I know know. That's like a Dwayne question all the way. Cause I know you, <laughs> yeah. you had to have thought about this. Yeah. I mean, wow. I think about how many Afrofuturists were, you know, house inspired, you know, you know, cause when I think of Afrofuturists, especially like from the seventies era, right. I think of, I think of George Clinton and Funkadelic. I think mm-hmm. of LaBelle. I think of, uh, you know, so many groups like that who were drawing, you know, their, even their imagery was, you know, very futuristic. Um, and I believe, you know, I believe that, you know, um, House is inspired by all that, you know. Um, and, you know, the moments that we started creating the music, you know, electronically, the moment that we start taking it into the future. Um, so I think Afrofuturism has always been embedded in the culture. Um, and just the, in the, you describe, you know, even, even the way you describe the temple, right. And, the and the stairs that ascend and stuff like that, 
house has always been about ascension. You know, those that want to hear the classics, that's just them wanting this nostalgia. Like we always want you to remind us of a day that we felt good. Or we always want to, even like when you think about hip hop, you know, you think about when, you know, it takes them back to a time where they were in college. And, you know, I remember that day I went and got this certain tape and my boy was there and we smoked the blunt and, you know, Keisha with the fat booty came over. And, you know, so it's always going to be that that moment where people want to take you to that moment where they feel good. But ultimately, you know, um, especially, like I said, with House, we want, you know, I want that lift off. I want that, I want to be lifted off into the future, you know. Um, and that's the one thing I loved about House as opposed to hip hop. Hip hop definitely spoke to the streets where House music lifted us up out of it and mm. lifted us, li- lifted us higher. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I think it still does that. Um, yeah, it's like a kind of a dose of reality versus some kind of transcendent escape. Yeah, from, yeah. You know? and you know, Afrofuturism is transcendence. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Yes. I, so I think that I think the, the two kind of go hand in hand. I heard that. So in the time that we have left, I know um, you all are involved in other projects that are passionate that revolve around the music and so just wanted to see if you could speak on some of those some of your favorite maybe interests that don't necessarily directly involve djing but is definitely revolving around the culture well i won't have one i want to talk about because i need to actually call john i need to get john involved um i've been working for, for years with um you know jody presser and um made a mcneil honeypot performance mm-hmm. well, we've been working on a project called the chicago black social culture map um, where we have been trying to document uh, Black social culture in Chicago from the blues era throughout the house era. And I mean, literally have an interactive map online where people are going to be able to go on this map and and learn about all these various locations. When You know, because when you talk about Chicago social culture, it's always the same stories of Bronzeville and somehow just magically skip to the warehouse, the power plant, the music box, and thank you, good night. <laughs> um, you know, and but there's been so much social culture throughout these eras, you know, um, and we're trying to document every aspect of it from the nightclubs that we occupied to the after hours restaurants we ate in, like Golden Nugget, like Muskies, like anything like that, you know, to the record stores. You know, that's why I was mentioning, you know, I couldn't think of the, we was the other day brainstorming trying to think of the name of that record store that was an Archer. Uh, and so we've really been we've been at this project for some years now um, mm-hmm. and we have some virtual uh, virtual discussions coming up. We were supposed to have one this Saturday with, with uh, the passing of my sister. I had to postpone it uh, to September 12th. Uh, we're going to focus on the, the Four Corners corridor of North Avenue, Damon in Milwaukee and how that corridor in the 90s was the bridge between these genres and cultures of music between hip hop, poetry, house you know, with Red Dog, with Lit X, with all that being right there on those four corners. Mm. Um, and then we want to actually, another panel we want to talk about, um, uh, uh, some brands, some DJ brands, like Excursions and like that, that um, branded themselves and in, in, in made national, um, you know, made themselves uh, a, a brand nationally, not just locally. And then we want to, you know, get into like Sonotech and those different things. So I definitely want to have John Simmons uh, so this is a formal invitation, John Simmons. <laughs> I'm there. Invitation accepted. Thank <laughs> you. I'd be honored to uh, to have that conversation. I heard sure. that. Yeah, that's it's a, it's important too because it shows that that things were deeper and definitely more complex than what this easy narrative yeah. is. And those that easy narrative is definitely classic, but there's yeah. so many other spots. You mentioned Lit X. I mean, that's where I landed when I moved to town. That was like the first place I went. And they, I walked in as this 25-year-old, like wanting to read some poetry. And they were like, open arms. And they embraced me. And I was like, okay, Chicago will work for me. And I think that's the importance of places like that. I mean, it welcomes you. That's the welcome yeah. wagon. That's the neighbor saying, yeah. it's okay. You good, you know? And so we're looking for people with stories and we also, not just stories, if anyone that you know that has old flyers, old 
pictures of themselves in a space, old video footage, anything. Like we want to actually get, we want to document this. We have black, we have a black archivist team mm. that um, are, you know, taking the materials and and um, and not so much taking its own, but taking it to to scan, to get, to preserve, and then yeah. So we got to really understand that a lot of these artifacts are is our history being told. So if you know anybody with any old flyers from any event they went to between up until now, like like I said, the history didn't end. So I got a bunch of Ray flyers for you. Okay. So yeah. I'll give you a little taste of the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that. So in the time we have left, John, because that time is running out, um, what are some of the other projects that uh, are inspiring you now? Well, man, you know, I, I came out of this, uh, came into this quarantine fast and furious um, with a ton of live streams. So I, I put a lot into it and you guys can check that out. Anyone can check it out. They're all on my Instagram um, and my Facebook. And I got into the Twitch thing and I've um, done a number of live streams. I did a couple for After School Matters. Uh, I did a couple for Vocalo. Um, Agitator Gallery, uh, The Freak Easy, um, and also did sets for West Fest and Shari Vari. So I've still been fortunate to stay somewhat busy in the DJ realm, although everything has been online. Um, but uh, I, I have all those sets up. Uh, other than that, uh, I've also just been teaching for After School Matters. We just got done teaching the summer session um, through Google Classroom for the first time. So Mm -hmm. uh, we're about to go on the fall session with a little bit more knowledge and uh, just expertise on how to work that platform. So if you all know anyone who's a uh, Chicago public high school team, um, they can do it from their freshman year through their senior year and they get a stipend of $420. Uh, it's eight weeks for the fall session, eight weeks for spring and six weeks for summer. Um, my program is based out of the Firehouse Community Arts Center in North Lawndale. So we focus on, you know, a lot of inner city teams. And, uh, you know, it has always been in person in the past, but now we're teaching them um, with Serato Play, which is a laptop only version of Serato DJ. Um, so we're teaching them the basic skills on how to build their library and how to put a set together. Um, so doing that after school matters thing. Um, but also wanna say, I mean, house music is Afrofuturism in a nutshell. When you think about the technology, you know, taking the 808, taking the 909, taking the 303. I mean, black music is, everything about black music is futuristic from jazz to rock and roll to funk. Like you said, you know, everything about black music is is revolutionary techno look at what they've done up in detroit with techno which is house music's um broken beat you know like we said and then not, let's not forget about all the modern jazz that that's going on um, mm -hmm. out there now so, so black music has always been futuristic and uh yeah it's just we're just keeping that tradition going we just we, we're just continuing to push that music and we, there's so many amazing artists out there that have contributed to the growth of the music over the years. And, you know, I, I can't wait to see where it goes in the future, but I think we're in a good place. I, I really like what I'm hearing. Um, out of a lot of young artists and older artists nowadays, but, you know, black music has always been futuristic and uh, it's, it's a cool thing to be on this uh, platform for Burning Man as well. And uh, again, just honored to be on here with you guys to talk about this and I think we all are just trying to do our part to keep it to keep the music and uh and the scene you know our our environments our culture and our communities moving forward so I just I think that's what we try to do that's a perfect way to end it and and I wholeheartedly agree and I thank you guys for your time and your your stories and your knowledge and so appreciate you um and so Dwayne Powell, DJ Dwayne Powell, you can catch him. And DJ John Simmons, you know where they are. And so check them out. If you're unaware, now you're aware and you better be aware and get 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 down with it. Cause we just had the tip of the iceberg. There's so much going on with both of you. And so 
I wish I wish you all much continued success in getting through this situation and getting on the other side of that. And we can be partying in person, sweating on each other sooner than later. You know. Hope so. Yeah. Blessings to you all, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Alrighty. Okay. All right, you guys. Yes. Good talking with you.